There was one who was willing to die in my stead, that a soul so unworthy might live. And the path to the cross he was willing to tread, all the sins of my life to forgive. They are nailed to the cross, they are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross, but he carried my sins with him there. That is a beautiful hymn. Today we're going to go over the hymn Nailed to the Cross, which is one of my favorite hymns, and I'll tell you why. Um, this was written by Carrie Breck. She lived from 1855 to 1934. She was born in Vermont. She married and they moved, she and her husband moved to Oregon and they had five daughters. She was always in poor health throughout her life, but she continued to write hymns and poems and she wrote some other beautiful hymns. Besides Nailed to the Cross, she also wrote Shall I Crucify My Savior, another beautiful, so well-written hymn uh, about the crucifixion. And um, she also wrote the hymn Face to Face. That are, those are just all beautiful hymns. And what I truly love about the hymn Nailed to the Cross is that she makes it personal. A lot of hymns can be um, kind of broad and they, they're talking in general terms, but Carrie Breck has written hymns that make it personal. It's saying, I, it's my sins. And that's what I love about it. It makes the hymn so very moving and touching. And I appreciate that so much about her hymns. So let's start doing a study, and we're going to try and do it a little shorter today, on um, the hymn Nailed to the Cross. Let's first look up Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 13 and 14. Colossians 2 verse 13, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And so that hymn, that verse is, is at the top of our hymn in, in our book that we use, um, Colossians 2, 13 and 14, um, using that right there, having nailed it to the cross. Our sins are nailed to the cross because of what Jesus did for us. Now, the, co the gospel accounts of Jesus' trial and scourging and his crucifixion, um, that all can be found in the gospel accounts, Matthew 27, chapter 27, Mark chapter 15, Luke chapter 23, and John chapter 19. And we're not going to go through all of those accounts. That's something you can study on your own. But those are each of the gospel accounts of his trial, his, his um, torture and scourging, and his crucifixion. Now let's first look, let's go to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins has hidden his face from you 
so that he will not hear. So clearly right here, it's telling us our sin separates us from God. Our sin separates us. And unless we take those steps that the New Testament teaches us to come back in fellowship with God, we are separated from God because of sin. And let's look up some other verses. Let's look up Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Very familiar verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So sin will lead us to eternal damnation, to eternal death. If Again, if we are not obedient to the commandments that are laid out in the New Testament, it will be death. But if we obey those things that are written, the commandments that, are, that we are given, the steps we are given to obey God's word, then we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ, through Jesus, who was that perfect sacrifice. He was the perfect Lamb of God who was willing to suffer for us. Let's also read Romans 3. 23 again the book of Romans chapter 3 verse 23 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and we've referenced that a lot we all sin there is no one perfect there is no one sinless on this earth every human every man and woman sins which is what separates them from God the only one who was sinless was Christ. And even though we try very much to be Christ-like, we are not perfect, we are not sinless, and we need the blood of Jesus. Let's go to 1 John, 1 John, and chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So, here again, the New Testament is teaching us, yes, we all have sin. We can't say that we don't sin. We all sin. We are fleshly, and we all sin. Even once we're Christians, we're baptized, we've done those steps to be Christians and to be pleasing to God, we still sin because that is the nature of mankind. Um, we, we sin, we will fall, we will do the things that aren't pleasing, but once we are a baptized believer, we have the opportunity to repent of what is done. But we will continue to sin. We all sin. And let's also look at, at 1 John chapter 2. Back in 1 John chapter 2, and this time we're going to read verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So here in the book of 1 John, it's telling us, he, John is writing to them so that they can be encouraged and do the steps so maybe that they won't sin as much. But still, we're not going to be perfect. But when we do sin, we have Jesus Christ as our advocate. Now, the word propitiation, not a word I use very often, only when we're talking about Bible things, it means to gain or regain favor, or goodwill. So he is the one who goes before the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, goes before the Father on our behalf to say, I will speak for them. I will get them to be in goodwill again when we are repentant of the things that we have done. And, and that, is, that is how God takes care of, of sin in our lives. Jesus was that perfect sacrificial lamb on the cross for us. 
So let's start with reading verse one and the hymn nailed to the cross. There was one who was willing to die in my stead that a soul so unworthy might live and the path to the cross he was willing to tread all the sins of my life to forgive. And that's what I mean about this hymn. Here, beginning in just verse one, Carrie makes it so personal and we need to remember that. And it's so easy to think Jesus died for all of us, which he did, but he died for me and it's my sins that put him on the cross. And so we need to remember to make it personal. And when we sing this hymn, make it personal. Think about it personally. My sins put Jesus on the cross as though I was right there nailing those, those huge nails, huge nails into his hands and into his feet. That's me doing that. That's you doing that because we all are guilty of sin. So Christ died for our sins. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3. Here is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthians. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So Jesus died for our sins, clearly taught, clearly taught by accounts in the gospels, the gospel accounts, and then the other apostles teach that over and over again. He is who died for our sins. Let's look at Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 3 and 4. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, here in the book of Galatians, Paul, the apostle, again, writing to them, teaching them Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins, okay? And he was willing, there was one, capital O, one, who was willing to die in my stead. It should have been me crucified for my sins. Jesus took my place. He was willing to die in my stead, okay? So let's go on to Romans, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that is love. That is love that we are still sinners but he loves us and he wants us to be brought back to him and through the plan that God had. And it's not up to me to think it was a good plan or it could have been done differently. That's the perfect plan God had. And I am to accept that plan and to live righteously according to what is taught in the New Testament. It's not up to me to think it was a good plan decision or Christ shouldn't have died or it could have been done a different way. That's not up to me. That is not up to me. I need to believe the Bible and follow the Bible and be so very thankful, so very thankful that Jesus was willing to do that for me because there is no other way to be saved. There is no other way to be saved except for Jesus' blood on the cross. Okay. Now let's go back to the book of Colossians. We're going to go back to the book of Colossians, the first chapter this time, and we're going to read verses 13 and 14 again. But this is chapter one this time. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom 
of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. There is no clearer way to put that. That is so logically, clearly stated. It is through the kingdom of His Son of His love, that is Jesus Christ, God delivered us from the power of darkness. We do not have to be in the clutches of Satan. God delivered us and we have redemption through his blood, through Jesus' blood, the forgiveness of sins. We have forgiveness of sins because Jesus was willing to die on the cross and shed his blood. And he was that perfect sacrifice for us. Okay, let's also... Go to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7, and start in verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to, to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy harmless undefiled separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Again, very clearly, logically written for us. Jesus is able to save us when we come to God through him, through Jesus. He is our high priest. He is the perfect high priest who gave himself and he gave himself for our sins to be taken away when we are obedient to the steps that the New Testament teaches us. He did this once for all, unlike the priests in the Old Testament, that they would offer sacrifices again and again for the people. Jesus did the perfect sacrifice, dying on the cross once for all, once for all of mankind, for those who are willing to accept it. And follow those commandments okay let's also go to first Peter and I hope you are following following with me in your Bibles I don't want you to take my word for anything you need to follow along with me first Peter chapter 2 and verse 24 who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Okay? Himself bore our sins, that is Jesus. Bore our sins on the tree, which is another way of saying on the cross. That was another reference that they gave to that. On the tree, on the cross. That we can live, when we die to sins, we can live for righteousness. And it's through the, the stripes, the suffering that Jesus suffered, the death that he suffered, we are able to be saved. Okay, let's also go to Revelation, the book of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Again, you can't misunderstand that. He, when, when you continue to read the verses, the, the chapters, the books in the New Testament, again, the teaching is the same. There is no contradicting. He loves us. He loved us so much. He gave his life for us. He washes our sins away in his own blood. So 
let's um, let's also learn about how Christ's blood forgives us. Let's go to Ephesians. We, we talked about how he died for our sins and he gave his blood for our sins. Let's talk about how that blood forgives us. Let's look at the book of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace the forgiveness of sins because of his blood which was shed on the cross. Let's also go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once, I'm sorry, let me start again. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Same teaching, same teaching. Jesus' blood is what? Forgives us of our sins and brings us back in fellowship with God and with Jesus. Let's go back to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Here the Hebrews writer is making the comparison of the sacrifices that were given before by God's people and the sacrifice that is given by Jesus, the sacrifice on the cross by Jesus. Okay, let's also look at verse 22. Okay, still Ephesians, I'm, I'm sorry, not Ephesians, still Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And the word remission is forgiveness. So without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. Jesus willingly went to the cross to forgive us of our sins and Again, I'm saying this over and over again so it is clearly understood. It is not that you just believe and that is the end of it. You believe and you take those steps. You hear the word. You believe the word. You repent and change the life that you had before. You are willing to confess that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you believe the Bible and all of the teaching of the Bible and you are willing to be baptized, completely immersed in water, which is the way that God prescribed for us to be saved. We are baptized in water. We come up a new person. We come up a new creature, as the New Testament tells us, and we are members of his church. God adds us to his church. We cannot just believe and that's the end of it. We need to believe. We absolutely need to believe, but we also need to take the other steps that are written down for us, very understandable in the New Testament. Okay? Now, let's read verse 2. He is tender and loving and patient with me while he cleanses my heart of its dross. But there's no condemnation. I know I am free, for my sins have been nailed to the cross. Okay, there again she makes it personal. My sins are nailed to the cross. Okay, and he cleanses my heart of its dross. Now the word dross means any waste or any impurities in something. He's cleansing our heart of the impurities of sin 
in our heart. He's cleansing that and he's making us a new creature and a Christian that we need to serve God and be as righteous as we can be and to not live according to the flesh. Okay, let's look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That is where she's getting in this, in verse 2, she says, but there is no condemnation, I know I am free. That's where she's getting this from, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And we are in Christ when we have been baptized into Christ. That is how we are in Christ. And we are not to walk according to the flesh. We are not to live according to the world and do worldly things. We need to live spiritually according to what the Bible teaches us. Okay? So, um, we know that we are free. Our sins are nailed to the cross. Okay? And that goes back to the book of Colossians that we read earlier. Now, let's read verse 3. I will cling to my Savior and never depart. I will joyfully journey each day with a song on my lip and a song in my heart that my sins have been taken away. All right. So she's going back to Colossians, what we read first, Colossians chapter 2, and let's read verse 14 again. We're um, about halfway through verse 14. We're going to start there. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. He meaning Jesus. He's taken those requirements out of the way that were against us, and he nailed it to the cross. And that is how we can have our sins taken away. The blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross takes our sins away at our obedience. Okay, and let's read the chorus. And the man that did the, the, the uh, musical notes to this and did the arrangement, it starts off slowly. It start, I mean, not slowly, it starts off softly. They are nailed to the cross, and then it's supposed to be very soft. They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss Jesus went to the cross, but he carried my sins with him there. So, so beautifully written. So beautifully written. It's one of those hymns that really, I don't want to say tugs, <laughs> it, really, it really pierces your heart. It, it just, it cuts down inside of you and just makes you so thankful for what Jesus did for us. And that's what, that's what hymns are supposed to do. They are supposed to move us and touch us and help encourage each other and that we are we are um, encouraged and we're willing to go on and remember the things that Jesus did for us. And this is the crucial part in history. William has done lessons on this. Everything from Genesis, everything from the creation until Jesus dies on the cross, and then from then on, everything forward looks back to the cross. So from creation to the cross, there were prophecies leading to that happening. And that is the pivotal point in history where Jesus is crucified on the cross. It is the most important point in history. And then we, looking back to the cross, so thankful that he did that for us and that we will have a way to have eternal life. When our life is over, we can have eternal life in heaven with God and with Jesus. And so thankful that he was willing to do that for us. So I tried to make 
the class a little shorter today, although this hymn is so dear to me. It is, it is one of my absolute favorite hymns. She was a wonderful, very, even though they said she didn't have a lot of education, and she was a, I say simple housewife, and I don't mean that derogatory. I mean, that was what she did all of her life. She was a housewife and a mother out in the country of, of Oregon, and that was what she did with her life, but she also was brilliant enough to write these beautiful hymns that we still sing today. And, and I hope it is a hymn that you will do some more study on and study the gospel accounts of, of Jesus' um, trial and the suffering he went through, the crucifixion. And let's remember that Nailed to the Cross is a, is a good hymn to center our minds on the Lord's Supper on a, on a Lord's Day during worship. Um, which is a, a good thing we need to center our minds when it's time for that. But it's also a hymn we can think about any time. And let's remember that we are doing the class Singing with the Understanding and to make sure that we are not just singing flippantly or without thought. We need to understand what the words are when we sing them. So thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I ask that you please like our channel, like the YouTube channel, like the Facebook, and please share these lessons with others. Try to keep it short today, and but very poignant, very important helm. Thank you for being with me today, and I'll see you next time.